Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Roman winemaking. You get about four years. Almost ready. Ah, yes, the Roman days where we all wear togas and drink delicious wine and, you know, get close with each other for days on end. Well, I hate to break it to you, but this wine sucked. It was dangerous to consume. Being a winemaker, this ancient sommelier, you would consume about 12 grams of lead per day, just tasting your creation, right? It's horrible. Winemakers would harvest the grapes, they would press the fat with their feet, the best part, right? It's what we all wanna do. And then in order to wash out that size 14 Roman foot taste, makers would lace the wine with lead to, you know, sweeten it up. Remember what we did to Coca-Cola back in the day? That wasn't nearly as bad as a bottle of red lead redemption back in the ancient Roman times. Yeah, I'm gonna never complain about table wine at a wedding ever again. Red or white, I'm like, thank you. I don't care if it's really warm, thank you. Number nine, leech collectors. Dude, if you didn't grow up fishing, this next one's gonna make your skin crawl. Leeches, just watch Stand By Me, you'll get it. These blood suckers have been collected for years, like centuries years, and still used to this day. Used as an ancient medicinal aid, leeches would let your blood, bloodletting. Basically just suck out all the infection, disease, germ, nastiness, right out of you and all out of that wound. They basically eat the infection and speed up the process. A leech collector did exactly that. They jumped into bogs and marshes and just kinda let them attach themselves to, well, themselves. Then bottle them up and sell them. Tons of health benefits too. Some negatives, of course. First off, the leech collectors could bleed a lot. Obviously, right? Back and forth, in and out of the river for hours. Sometimes these guys would even pass out or die. No band-aids, unfortunately. No added danger pay, too. I didn't expect that one. Number eight, armpit plucker. My unibrow, this right here, this is a new hobby of mine. I'm plucking this bad boy every other day, and I'm thrilled about it. Armpit hair, on the other hand, I would shriek, okay? I only have like seven armpit hairs, so I gotta preserve them, right? But in ancient times, they gots to go. Working out was often done naked, right? Ancient Greek naked exercise in the scorching sun, ah, nothing better. So naturally, an armpit or two is gonna stink. So the solution here to stay, you know, sane while you're training was for everybody to just pluck their armpit hairs out, okay? No more unpleasant odors, that's it. But the point here, imagine doing that job. Somebody had to do, doink, someone had to do all of them. I mean, plucking hairs now, that's satisfying at least and a little bit you know, easier. You could laser half your sh But a warrior's armpit, no thank you. The Old Spice guy would have quit his job. Number seven, barber surgeons. If you like candy like me, you've made a regular visit to the dentist. Little numbing here, a little numbing there, a little flavored mold and floss. Yeah, not always as comfortable. Actually, a trip to the dentist chair was extremely scary and dangerous. Good news is they also cut your hair. A barber surgeon was a very popular and respected job throughout the Roman times all the way to about the 18th century. These people were skilled at anything surgical. Remove a tooth, get all the bugs and lice out of your hair, eh, I'll do it in one sitting. Not the cleanest job though. Lice, blood, infected teeth just hanging around all day, the smell alone, ugh. You know everyone had tonsil stones back then too. Worms living in their teeth? They had an extensive understanding of the human body. Well, as best they could. These people were also in charge of dyeing hair as well. Pigeon poop, urine, dung. These people tried it all for that Farrah Fawcett blonde blowout. Okay, so a little one on the sides, two on top, and then we're just gonna yank those teeth right out of ya. All right, should be about 15 minutes. Number six. Toad doctor. If you don't want to go through the lengths of becoming a medical doctor or doing anything, you know, just go the toad route. It's a little bit easier. Be very specific about where you're doing your activities. There you go. That way your competition is next to none, right? There you go. Back in the day, it was the 1600s, mind you, but medical researchers believed that toads had inside of them healing properties. That's me spreading out of a, a toad, so you can see that. So they were often dried up and powdered and then applied directly to your skin to soothe inflammation. Awesome. I don't know what's worse in this situation, the guy getting the toad's guts rubbed on his orbital or the doctor who has to dry up said toad. Both are pretty bad. Number five, gardeners. If you've ever done some fun gardening on a nice Sunday afternoon, you'll know that your back hurts. There's bees everywhere and it's hot under that sun. Gardening is hard work. Imagine being a gardener in Rome or Middle Ages. Like no tools, no water source, no sun safety. And the king's private fruits here and queen's favorite red anthuriums there. Gardens up walls, secret private hidden gardens underground. That's a long day. Also, that's a lot of walking pails of water to these things. Yeah, no hoses. Like to walk to the river and grab a bucket and come back, a lot. 
These people must have had shoulders and lats like a great white shark, dude. Just squatting double pails for 16 hours a day? You know those people were jacked. Also, they didn't have weed whackers, so when you look at these beautiful painted castles and gardens, just know someone was getting screamed at with a rusty pair of shears. Yeah. Also, no lawnmowers. Like how? The whole field? Okay. Number four, Arming Squire. Being a knight obviously sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, the lady, they're saving the, you know, the damsel in the tower with the dragon and the breath. We get it, we've seen Shrek. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, okay? But that's just what being a knight is, right? It's glorious, right? Well, first of all, this process starts when you're seven years old. Then you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. Now, finally, at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but a royal job nonetheless. And also, you don't have a choice, so have fun. Arming squires, see, these lads had the responsibility of repairing a knight's armor while the knight was still wearing it. Yeah, up close and personal. Yeah, which buckle broke was it? Awesome, awesome. How was the battle? You guys did really well out there. Yeah, repairing chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal. Welcome to the Dark Ages, I guess. After these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor, inside and out. Yeah, this was long before Dawn soap was a thing. So they had to clean said armor with urine. Yeah. Hey, let's wash this piss out with a bucket of piss. That ought to do it. Number three, alchemists. Alchemy in history has gone through a couple of transitions. Basically, at first, an alchemist dealt with everything. Literally. From ancient China, India, and Greece, these people mixed what they could find and see. You know what I mean? See what happens if we mix some dirt and some olive oil. You know, write it down. They were scientists. It's the foundation of chemistry alone. They did experiments, heavily spiritual, philosophical, and medicinal. Medieval alchemists produced hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sodium carbonate. They were good. One eye of newt here, a little stomach acid here, and whoa, 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 whoa! Also so heavily associated with witchcraft and wizardry over the years. Potions, elixirs, the alchemist's purpose was to advance and help with the quality of life. Lots of explosions though. Yeah, very dangerous. Mercury, carbon monoxide, yeah, dangerous stuff. They were playing around with things that were really bad for us. For the purpose of making us better. Very selfless job, you know? Number two, rower. I can't even raise my hand in class longer than six minutes. I have to start holding it, then I switch, and then I just bail on the question, and then I live my life not knowing what hydrogen is. All right, I couldn't imagine being a rover, okay? Heading back to the times of ancient Greece where wars were fought through naval battle, left-handed, right-handed, guess what, it didn't matter. Your arms were shaking every single day, all day long. When we think of these rowers, this job obviously sucked. It was one of the worst to have, and more often than not, it was sadly slaves who had the misfortune of propelling these warlords into their battle. The payment was also non-existent, really. Just a meal for the day, if that. Asking for a break or not keeping up to the rower next to you would ultimately lead to your death. And the number one spot, the gong farmer. The stink of all stinks. These men were employed to go around and basically scoop and clean out bathroom houses. Plumber waste disposal hybrid. You get where I'm going with this. They were the people who dug out and removed human excrement from privies and cesspits. They were the OG waste collectors. But by hand, yeah. And scoops and buckets and stuff. No gloves, no PPE, just hand loading them into trolleys, buckets sloshing all over the place in the middle of the night. Obviously being disgusting, gong farmers were only allowed to work at night, hence the nightmen. These guys would have to hop down into these pits at night, waist deep, swimming around, and just taking turns on who's loading and who's scooping. They were paid well though, yeah, usually double or triple the regular. Toxic gases, infections, drowning, this job was dangerous. And definitely the grossest, just sitting on your lunch break, you know what I mean? Ah. Ham and cheese, yum. Kicking off our list at number 10, ship surgeon. Ah yes, just the place you want to get a root canal, the high seas. During the age of sail, the Royal Navy, of course, needed trained medical officers aboard its warships. People got sick, obviously, they got sick a lot back then, so this is who would have to deal with them. By 1814, the Royal Navy had 850 surgeons with 500 assistants, all caring for 130,000 men on shore and at sea. Yeah, they would make a lot of money, but in turn, it's a disgusting job. The surgeon was responsible for his entire crew. They would have to visit patients at least twice a day and keep accurate records on each of them. Again, on a ship. Not a hospital, but on a rocking ship. Surgeons were responsible for regulating sanitary conditions on the ship. Yes, sand would have to be poured down on the bottom of the cabins to avoid the doctors slipping from all the 
blood on the ground, yeah. It's, it's that kind of gross, you know what I mean? Number nine, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, we imagine the swinging doors, a few catchphrases here and there, and then of course, whiskey. The bartender pours a drink, the cowboy takes the bottle instead, and then walks away, so illegal. Sir, that is theft, bring that right back. That's a classic cowboy, right? Back in the wild western days, grabbing a drink at the bar sucked. It wasn't great, it was deadly, if anything. Bartenders had no regulations to follow behind that rickety, rotten bar. So, not only was it very high proof, but some bevies like tarantula juice, yeah, if its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made from poisonous ingredients, hence tarantula juice. It was made from strychnine, and if you drank it, you felt like there was tarantulas crawling all over your skin. Yeah, which button do I press to not tip the bartender? Thanks, thanks so much. Number eight, medieval punishment cleaner. If this isn't your first rodeo here on Bumblebee, you've heard us talk the many horrors of medieval history. A lot, of, uh, a lot of heads coming off around a lot of horrible kings. Many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and walk home. This was normal back then. So gross. One of the earliest documented executioners began all the way back in 1202, the OG headsman, Nicholas Yuhan. Their nickname was The Justice, which I mean, as far as nicknames go, it's pretty sick. Afterwards, of course, there was inspiration. This position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, but with them came the execution cleaners. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yep, hope you like mopping. You'll be doing a lot of that over with uh, King Henry. Number seven, violin string maker. A violin may sound beautiful, but the way those strings would come together, even before the 17th century, not so lovely, not so, uh, it's kind of yuck. In order to make strings thick enough to play these three stringed violins, the go-to method back then involved twisting strands of sheep innards together. Yeah, hours would have to be spent just trimming away at fatty tissue or blood vessels, muscle, you name it, things you don't want to see or smell. Yeah, you got to sift through that for a bit. It did not look like a music shop at that moment, yuck. And then said guts had to be soaked in wood ash to further clean and avoid rotting. Nowadays, it's a little different. Actually, not really, it still sucks for animals, but you know, less bloody, less dirty, I guess, all around. Number six, nomenclator. Basically, a campaign volunteer back in the Middle Ages. Only you weren't a volunteer, and the campaign was a miserable fat king. A nomenclator in old European times was responsible for remembering names of people that the king met all night long. You know, how to contact new business partners, which family they're in, which family they're not in, you know, keeping track of all the social politics of being a king. All that responsibility fell on the nomenclator because the king was too busy getting drunk and partying or cheating or beheading. No way a drunken king is gonna remember all these new faces from all over the land. That's, that's all this poor fella over here. Sorry, was it Arthur or Arnold? Yeah, I can't hear you over all this capital punishment. Thanks, you have to speak up a bit. Number five, the bone grubber. Heading to the Victorian era, a classic time to be grossed out by everything in sight. More than fair, the great stink, oh God. Victorian cities back in the day had this huge scavenging economy. I'll get more of that later on in this list, but the bone grubber, this was unique. This was a unique role in history. These workers would scavenge rotting bones from butchers or garbage piles. Wherever leftover meat was disposed and then animals hadn't got to them yet. That's where we're heading here. To then later on, sell them to dealers. Ideally, the bones would be made into toothbrush handles or teething rings, anything really. Creativity was booming, I guess. The rest would go into soap making. Yeah, it was just melted and then just put on you and everywhere. So if you have any bones, hey, reach out, there you go. We'll DIY it up in the comments. Number four, fullers. Urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Awesome. They also used urine to wash their clothes. This isn't news. They didn't use soap back then because the amount of ammonia in urine just often did the trick. So, you know, and also it's free. Why not? Lye was also used to clean clothes at the time, but it was pricey. So plan B was to head down to the old laundromat and hand over your dirties to a fuller. Yeah, these lucky lads would have to stand in a tub filled with chemicals, water, and you guessed it, lots of urine. So much. Urine collected from all over the town, if I might add. Not just, you know, one dude, hey, I'm saving up. No, nope. if you've got it, bring it. Bring over the mess. They would then scrub and stomp out all of the yuck. And then it would get in your mouth and splash up in your eyes, horrible. Meaning most of the time, they were getting quite sick. Yeah, dangerous and disgusting job. Number three, resurrectionalist. All right, shout out to all the vampires watching. Nice, this one's for you. Hit that thumbs up, Dracula. A resurrectionalist was responsible for digging up dead bodies and then they would later sell them to medical schools. 
This was the late 1820s, and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, the medical science community was changing history. It was on the up and up, it was inclining. But in order to study new medicines to, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed these guys, sadly. I'll tell you who they didn't need though, William Burke and William Hare. Yeah, these Irish brothers were both resurrectionalists, in quotes, who were running out of patience. So they themselves would go and take people out and then proceed to sell their bodies right after. They did this 17 times. They killed 17 people all in the course of two years. They sold all their corpses to Dr. Robert Knox. It took 17 killings before somebody caught on. This is horrible. Even when there's no system in the works, this job is still nasty. You know what I mean? Remember dissecting that frog in high school? This is like, you know, you don't even wanna know. It's way worse, way worse. Number two, tushers. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even legal. Yeah, double, double the fun, there we go. Early 19th century London, a little more modern here, but worth a mention. These tushers would spend all their time in the sewers below London just trying to find coins or valuables, anything that's been accidentally washed or forgotten. That's how hard it was finding work back then. You had to climb into sewers to hopefully find some old earrings, maybe just searching for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim. Now, sometimes it was worth the plunge. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year, but then again, a lot of them wouldn't. They would just go down, find nothing, get sick, and that's the end, horrible stuff. And finally, number one, rat catchers. As the name hint towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats, right? There has to be some rat guy. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. And with these castles being dark and spooky and ominous and you have to walk through and do this a lot, there are probably plenty of rats below, crawling around your feet. You wouldn't even see them. Black rats were a common household problem, so in comes the well-respected rat catcher. It's catching all those rats. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of the rats. Uh, yeah, that's hilarious, that's hilarious. Like your Doctor Strange trying to do a spell, all the rats just plunge out of the sewers. If it worked, I'd shit my pants. But more often than not, that didn't work. So poison powders were the main trick of the trade for a rat catcher. The Pied Piper, he was an OG. He did musical numbers, pests came out, people were moving around, it was good. No one does it like him. Any rat catchers out there, you deserve a bonus. Especially now, ew, basements are way grosser, I think, in my opinion. Uh, hoarders, disgusting. Don't even get me started on hoarders. 